Hi, my name is Lars Christensen. In this video, I'm going to show you how to program this test part from start to finish with Inventor HSM. So we're going to move from the model environment to the CAM workspace. Now, if you're already familiar with Inventor, you will see that everything is very similar. The menus looks the same, and our toolpath will be created in the same fashion as features in our CAD workspace. First thing you always want to do when you're starting a CAM project is creating a setup. This is where we define how our model's XYZ is compared out of the machine. See, at the machine is pretty defined, what is up and what is down, left and right. But in the CAD world, there is no rules. You will receive models from engineers and designers where they clearly missed what was up or down on the model. Second thing we want to do in a setup is to find where we're going to pick up the part out at the machine. This process is pretty easy. First, always start from the top and work your way down. This is a milling part, so we can move on to the work coordinate section. You will see in the drop down that there's multiple options, but honestly, I only use one. And that is the select Z and X. So just worry about that one. You will see that we get a 3D triad displayed on the screen. This is the one we need to assemble to what we have out of the machine. You will see that there's an X button and a Z button that right now is compressed. Here's a simple rule. If you select a face or a plane, that axis will go perpendicular to that face. So with the Z axis button activated, I can go and click on this top face. And if you look at the 3D triad, you will see that it will flip perpendicular. The second rule is that if you select an edge, the axis will go along that edge. So if you press the X axis button and click on this edge, you will see the triad flips the X axis. Trust me, this is the hardest part when it comes to use CAM with an inventor. So click a face and it will go perpendicular. Click an edge and it will go along. Now where we have our axis straightened out, let's select where we're going to pick up the part at the machine. This is also what many times will be referred to as G54 or G55. I'm going to click on stock point and you will see that we get these blue balls displayed on the screen. Whenever you click one of those, your triad will move to that location. If you're a tool and die maker, you might like to pick a corner. Or if you're mold maker, you might want to select the center. That is where I'm going to leave mine. So I'm out of the machine, I will pick it up with an indicator and tram my X and Y so my Z axis is right on top of the part. Second tab is the stock. This is used for simulation, giving us an important picture into the future, letting us know what's going to happen when we hit that green button on the machine. By default, we have relative stock, what means that the machine have placed a box that surrounds our model, and we can add some additional stock. But also be aware that there's a fixed size stock. This is great if you actually have the stock in your hand so you can measure it. Also, I want you to be aware that there is something called solid. You can actually model up your stock. This is great if you're machining something like castings and things like that. Now we're going to turn it back to relative size stock and make sure that we have a little bit of extra stock on the sides and on the top. We're going to hit OK and we are now ready to apply our first toolpath. Now, for this part, we will be picking between standard 2-axis and 3-axis toolpaths. I will start with a standard facing. This will establish a flat datum on the top of our part, and I think generally most CNC programmers will start with this. Now, one thing that is important that I point out is that you will see that the menus are going to be the same no matter what toolpath we pick. This also goes for turning and even for 5-axis toolpath. These five tabs will always be in the same order and have the same meaning. This not only makes it easy to learn, but also easy to remember, 
especially if days or week could pass before you go back into the software. The first tab is always where you select your tool. Think of it as the same as if you were out at the shop floor. You will have your material in your hand and the next thing you will try to figure out is what tool do you have available to machine it. In the tool library, I'm going to scroll down to the tutorial folder and click on that. Most shop would have some kind of a face mill or big diameter insert cutter, but just to keep the tooling down for this specific job, I will pick a half inch end mill and click OK. You will see we can adjust feet and speeds down here, but we will come back to that a little later. Next tab is your geometry tab. You will see that the software have already created an orange boundary box around the part. It's smart enough to know that this is a facing operation, so we probably want to face off the entire stock. Now, we will come back and change this boundary later, but for now, let's just hit OK. We have just created our first operation. And we can at any time go up and click Simulate, and if we go down and click the Play button, we get a good picture of what's going to happen out at the machine when we press Cycle Start. Now, let's jump from a 2D facing operation to a 3D adaptive toolpath. Again, first tab is always where we select our tool, and we will just click and go and select the same half-inch end mill we used before. Again, we'll come back to feet and speeds later. Now, many times when I program, I'll just select my tool, click OK, and see what the software gives me. This is a lot easier than go in through all the different menus, change a bunch of things, and then try to correct things later. One thing that stands out is that the tool will machine all the way down to the bottom of the part. I was kind of planning on holding it in some kind of a vise. So to edit a tool path, I will go over and I will right click on the adaptive operation and select edit. So our first tab was always our tool. The second tab is where you can select your geometry. The third tab is where you can adjust your heights. Here I recommend that you start from the bottom and work your way up. Just because when it comes to machining, the depth is always your first concern you will see that the bottom height is set to modeling bottom. I'm just going to make an adjustment on the bottom offset. So I was thinking about holding on to half an inch, and then I'll add another thousand just for safety. So as you can see, you can do math right within these boxes. Next tab is our passes tab. This has everything to do with the cutter engaged in the material. Here are a few things I want you to be aware of. This tool path, adaptive, will calculate a constant chip load between our model and the stock that we specified. This means you will never come across a situation where your cutter will dig deep into a corner and in the worst case, snap. Because of that, we can go with the full depth of the cutter finally using the whole flute length that you paid for. And we can adjust the load of the cutter here in the optimal load section. This really comes down to what type of machine you got. I was planning on running this part in 6061 aluminum on a Haas VF2. So 200,000 loads should not be a real problem. But if you want to be conservative, let's change it to 100,000. Just remember, if this value goes into the thousands, you could be rubbing with the cutter. This is a roughing operation. Also notice how we have stock to leave turn on down here, leaving material for a finishing cut. Let's hit OK. And if you never used adaptive toolpath before, we should simulate this. I will click Setup, and thereby selecting both the facing and adaptive toolpath when we click Simulate. Now, you will see that all the toolpaths are displayed in blue on the model, and this might be in your way. 
You can click the toolpath mode and change the display to tail. Another thing you would like is the function to turn the stock on. Now hit play and after the facing operation, you will see the adaptive toolpath utilizing a constant load on the cutter, making sure our cutter is going to last a lot longer. You will notice that the adaptive only removes stock where the cutter will fit. The clover pocket on the top of the pot was left alone because here we need a smaller cutter. For this, let's explore the 2D adaptive toolpath. Again, we're finding ourselves with the task of picking a tool first. This time I will scroll down to the tutorial library and I'll pick a quarter inch flat end mill out of the library and hit OK. Feeds and speeds are for later. Second tab is our geometry tab. And I'm going to pick the bottom edge of the clover pocket and click OK. If we zoom in a little, you will see how unified the step over is on the bottom. Also notice how the tool is entering the material using a spiral entry. Here's a cool tip. If we go back into the tool path by right clicking and select edit and go to the last tab, this one has all to do about how we're entering and leave the cut. In the ramp section, you will see that there's a ramp taper angle. We will change this to 10 degrees and hit OK. And you will now see that the spiral entry has a cone shape. This would put a less pressure on the cutter and on the z-axis. End result, much better way to make chips. Now, I want to come back to the facing operation we started with. With all this material removed from the adaptive operation, one could argue that we really only need to create a top datum on a much smaller surface. Check this out. First off, we can drag and drop any operation in the setup tree. So instead of having the facing operation first, we can drag it to the end. Second, if we edit the facing operation and go to our geometry tab, we can redefine the area we really need. Again, let's pick setup in the operation tree and select all operation to go simulate. Notice the colored bar at the bottom of our window. We can click anywhere on it and speed up the simulation to that point. Let's fast forward to our second adaptive to see the spiral entry and our modified facing operation. Notice how the facing operation is leaving a small lip on the top face. Don't worry, you have all the functions you need to adjust your toolpath. We will go back into the operation, and on the Passes tab, we will offset the stock by 100 thousandths. Let's quickly go back and see that everything looks good. Going back to select a 3D toolpath, let's select the horizontal. Now, many times when we're talking about 3D, we're thinking of surfaces that have curved to them. But most of the times, there are also flat areas between. This is where this toolpath shines. To keep things simple, and our tools limited, I will select the same quarter inch end mill. Now, for geometry, we will hit the drop down and select selections. With 3D toolpaths, we can easily control the boundaries we want our tool to operate within. I am going to select the two edges that we want the toolpath to work with them. Then also notice how we can change the tool containment within those edges. I will change it to center of the tool, but add an additional hundred thousands for an offset. Pretty much telling our tool that we don't want the cutter to go past our boundary, but we will let it start outside the part. Again, 
you will see a nice representation of the toolpath on the part. Now it's time to apply some more finishing toolpath. We will use the 2D pocket toolpath to finish the two open pockets on each end and the clover shape on top. Again, we'll stick to our quarter inch end mill. And when selecting our geometry, we will make sure to select the edges of the open pockets and the clover. You will see that when selecting the edges of the open pocket, the software is taking the stock into consideration. On the Passes tab, we will check Finishing Passes to make sure we get a nice cleanup pass. And also notice how we could change the maximum step over. Lastly, because this operation is to finish the pockets, we will uncheck Stock to Leave and hit OK. Again, the option to look into the future with the simulate button is always a good idea. Now, I noticed that our clover pocket also has a ramp on the finish pass. We can shave some time off the machining process by going back into the operation. And if you remember, the last tab is where we can edit our lead in and lead out, and we can adjust our entry to a plunge. Let's apply the last finish passes to the model. We will use a 3D contour operation to machine the 3D cone surface. For this, we will use a ball end mill. Just like with the horizontal toolpath, we will choose selection on the geometry tab and pick the two edges for our boundary. I will also select contact boundary, but will calculate the tendency between the bald end mill and the surface that is being machined. You can always read more in depth of these functions by resting your mouse over a selection area. Now with the amount left over from the adaptive, you will prefer to create a semi-finished toolpath. On the passes tab, I will check stock to leave and leave 10 thousandths on both radial and actual stock. For this, I will leave a 40 thousand step over. When it comes to deciding on finishing 3 axis toolpath, there's always two factors. Required surface finish and time. Time equals money, right? The smaller step over, the better surface, but also, with smaller step over comes longer cycle times. Let's get our feet and speed straightened out so we can make a good judgment on the last surfacing machining. We can access all our tools through the tool library up on the ribbon bar. We will start with the half inch end mill. Right click, select edit, and go to the last tab on the right. This is feet and speeds. Now, feats and speeds really depends on what kind of machine and tooling you have on hand. You need to use your best adjustment. I'll be machining this in either aluminum or soft steel, as this is just a test piece. I'll be using a medium-sized vertical mill, like a Haas VF2. So I will go with a surface speed of a thousands and a chip load of two thousands of an inch. This should be fairly conservative for this type of machine. Next, I will go and right click and select edit for the quarter inch flat end mill. This is a little smaller, so I will go with 800 surface finish per minute and only one thousandth of an inch for chip load. Lastly, our ball end mill. Here, I will go with 400 surface feet per minute and 2000 chip load as it's really only cleaning up after our semi finish. Now, when we leave the tool library, you will see all our operations have a red flag on them. The software is aware of a change to feeds and speeds, and we will right click on our setup and select regenerate for our operations. 
With all our feeds and speeds updated, we can now check cycle times. I will click the plus sign next to our semi-finished surface toolpath and right click on the bottom parameter and select machining time. We will see that we have a strategy that will take right under 5 minutes. This gives me confidence that we can easily adjust our finish toolpath and assure good cycle time and acceptable surface finish. Instead of selecting another 3D contour toolpath from the ribbon bar at the top and do all our selections over, I will right click on our semi finish and select derived operations and navigate to the 3D contour toolpath. This will assure that all our selections and settings are brought right into this new toolpath. Now we just need to make a few adjustments. Like go to the passes tab and uncheck stop to leave. And just to get an idea, let's change the maximum step over to only one thousandths. This will probably cause our machining time to take too long, but the idea that within Inventor HSM we can easily get this valuable information and make good decisions. We will let our finishing toolpath calculate and then go in and check the machining time. This will take the finishing pass over two hours. It will look great, but honestly, I think we'll need to have this test piece finished within an hour. So we'll go back in and adjust the step over to five thousandths of an inch. Go back and we'll see that the toolpath is now less than one hour. We also need to clean up the parameter of this part. So I will jump from our 3D contour to a 2D contour. Again, the first tab is always the tool. We will see the same half inch end mill as before. And when it comes to geometry selection, we will pick the bottom edge of the part. We can easily raise the tool by going into the heights tab and use the bottom offsets like we did for the adaptive. 600 of an inch, that was what we used, and we could hit OK. Now this toolpath comes out great, but I want to show you a little trick. See how the end mill enters on the center of the surface. If you've ever seen this in the past, you will know that you will get a little lead in and lead out mark from the cutter being sucked into the material. Here's an easy fix. If you go back into the toolpath by right clicking and select edit, you go to the last tab and select entry point. Then select the corner edge and hit OK. This is an easy tip to make your parts look a lot more professional. The last toolpath we're going to apply will make anyone who has to handle parts after they come out of the machine happy. We will do a little deburring with a chamfer mill. Here HSM has a pretty powerful toolpath. In the drop down you will find 2D chamfer. To no one's surprise, the first selection is the tool and we will navigate to the tool library and find a chamfer mill. For our geometry, we are going to select the top edge around the part, the top edge of our clover pocket, and maybe to surprise of some of you, we will select the edge of each open pocket. Now, if you have ever tried to deburr parts in a mill, you know that gouging can be a nightmare. But the 2D chamfer is totally aware of areas of conflict. On the passes tab, I will adjust the chamfer to a 20,000. And on the preview, you will see the toolpath a short, but of course, the best way to verify everything is by simulating. Let's select setup, one so we can capture all the toolpath, and let's see our finished work. Now, I will speed up a little bit, but slow down when we come to the chamfer toolpath.
Take a look. See how the cutter comes in and leaves a nice chamfer while still keeping a safe distance to the vertical wall. With this, we only have a few steps left. First, let's make sure all our tool numbers are in the right order. We'll go back to the tool library and right click in the empty area, select renumber tools and the default value here is perfect. Click accept and okay. Next, let's pack all that up in a setup sheet we can bring out to the CNC machine. Click the setup sheet on the ribbon bar and the customizable HTML sheet with machining times and valuable information will be ready for print. Last, but maybe most important, the actual code for the machine. Notice all the post processes that ships with Inventor HSM. And just so you know, and if you click the post library link, you will find an extensive library of free posts for every major CNC machine on the market. I will select the Haas and click OK. And our editor will appear with our now ready to be machined code. I hope that you found this video helpful and I hope that this gave you the courage to go out and test out the code on your CNC mill.